Dismissed. Young adults, I believe, are dismissed as well. And uh, of course, the young, or the couples are in here tonight from my class. We started out there and came in, and we're glad they're here tonight as well. Thank you for being here on a midweek service. I know many of you have worked hard today and you've gotten much accomplished, but we're glad you're here. Thank you for that and excited about the service tonight. If this is your first time uh, to our church, thank you for coming. We don't take that lightly. We're glad you're here. And I hope you'll, you'll take a minute and uh, maybe fill out the visitor card and a seat back in front of you. We want to connect with you. We want to get to know you. We want to pray for you. And the teens did a great job singing. Praise the Lord for that. Luke in chapter number 11 tonight, if you will. Luke in chapter 11. I know Pastor Mutzler has been in, uh, I believe, 1 John 2. Uh, but we'll, we're going to kind of deviate a little bit and have a, really a standalone sermon tonight. Uh, but for those who are in our, our parent, I want a parent class, uh, teen parent class, uh, we've been, you know, talking about the home. And I want to really bring a message tonight about two different boys. Uh, one was a rule follower, one was a rule breaker, and they both were pursuing something, but at the end of the day, they both came up empty and searching, but Jesus Christ made all the difference in their lives in a relationship with Him. And so I want to teach a little bit about the home tonight, about a home, and, but I think it can apply whether you're single, married, whether you have kids or not. I think it can, comply, it can apply to all of us. And so if you have Luke chapter 15, if you could stand to your feet, uh, just give you one last chance to stretch. And in honor of God's word as well, we'll read these verses and then you can be seated. We're just going to read uh, four or five verses here in Luke chapter number 15 and verse number 11. Of course, a very familiar parable of the prodigal son. Uh, the Bible says, and he said, a certain man, by the way, it's on the screens as well, if you want to follow along. It says, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you so much for loving us. You sure are a great God. Thank you for people coming tonight all over, Lord. Many children, many teenagers, many young adults, Lord, many of us older adults in here as well. Lord, the nursery, Lord, just so many aspects tonight of people who came to hear your word in various forms and, and various uh, lessons, uh, but all under one purpose, that you be glorified and that we can become closer to you. I pray that you'll work in hearts like only you can. Uh, may you flow through me, may you help me get out of the way, and may, may it be clear and, and the presentation be exactly what you want. Tonight as I seek to preach your word, uh, thank you for those who are online, Lord, watching. I pray that you'll just open up their hearts. May they know they're cared for and loved for. We sure do love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A mother was preparing some pancakes for her sons. She had two boys, Kevin, who was five, and Ryan, who was three. The boys, as boys can do, especially brothers can do, begin arguing over who would get the first pancake. Their mother saw the opportunity for a moral lesson. And she said, boys, if Jesus were sitting here... He would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait for my turn. Well, Kevin, the older one, turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, how about you be Jesus? <laughs> you know, oftentimes in life, uh, if we're not careful, our sin nature, our flesh can get in the way. And uh, we can tend to be more selfish uh, than, than giving. And I want us to see this story tonight, a very familiar story. Maybe for some it's new. I don't want to discount that. It's an amazing story. It's a parable. It was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But I want us to see two different pictures tonight from the story at the brothers. We see two different brothers. Uh, really, at the heart of the issue, both dealt with selfishness. Uh, one thought they were doing right. The other one wanted to take what they have and left. But in the end... They both were empty. They just would have had a relationship with their father. It would have been so much better. And so with that being said tonight, I want us to see a family 
who is unraveling and falling apart. It's experiencing assaults on its integrity and cohesion. But we also want to see tonight how the gospel can bring about a change for good in each and every family. So number one, if you're writing tonight, we see the assault on the home. The assault on the home. And I want us to look at this family in verse number 12. The Bible says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Uh, in those days, of course you can see this in Deuteronomy 21, 17, but in those days, the elder brother would get the double inheritance of the younger one. So in this particular situation, the older brother was going to get two-thirds of the inheritance and the younger brother was going to get one-third of the inheritance. And we see there Deuteronomy 21, 17, but he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of his firstborn is his. And so in order, uh, of course, the key phrase here is this inheritance would not be given until the father would die. And that's very key because for the son, the younger son to ask for his inheritance before the father died would literally be saying to the father, I wish you were dead so I can get what I deserve. Could you imagine being that father? How hurt you must have felt. And this shows arrogant disregard for the father's final authority as head of the family. Now, in a traditional Eastern, Middle Eastern culture, a father would typically respond uh, 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 by, by beating the son, by verbally assaulting the son, and by kicking the son out. Now, this father did not do that, but that is what was typically happened. And here's why. Because it was the utmost humiliation for a Middle Eastern family. It would show that their name would be tarnished, and back in those days, name meant everything... Uh, the son would want to get out from his, under his father, and he'd want to really disregard and totally get away from his father's name and his heritage and everything he was connected to. But the father did not respond that way. In fact, the father gave of the third of the inheritance, which would have had to be to sell the land, at least, and a third of that to be given, they uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll get into that in just a second, okay? But we see uh, uh, the story continues on. If you know anything about the story, the son leaves, um, spends all his money, ends up uh, getting to the place where he has nothing, so he's e eating pig food, and then he comes to himself and says, hey, wait a minute here, my dad's servants are getting treated better than I am, so, so I'm going to go back home and just be a servant. Well, he comes back home, and his dad sees him and runs with arms open and, and takes him back and, and, and gets this great big feast and everything's going great and, and everything's good until reconciliation is just starting to happen and then the older brother gets involved. So we see the first brother's assault was really selfishness. Give me mine. I don't care what it means to you. I don't care how or your name will be tarnished or how humiliated you'll be. I don't care what you're dealing with or, or, or what people think about you. It doesn't matter. Just give me my inheritance and I want to get out of here. The second son stays and he continues to work hard. But I want us to see not only the younger brother's assault, but I want us to see the older brother's assault in verse number 25. The Bible goes on to say, Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music and dancing. Of course, he's coming from the field, so he's probably working. He probably just finished his night of work and probably getting tired and ready for a good meal and then to relax for the night. And he hears music, he hears dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, this is his servant, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Well, notice with me verse number 28. The Bible says, And when he was angry, and would not go in. You know what the older brother was saying? Hey, uh, I, I'm not going to go in there. I'm not going to associate with him. He, he is no longer my brother. In fact, if you look uh, at verse... Uh, let's see here, I believe verse number uh, late 29 it says, or maybe 30, he, he says, um, this thy son, when he's talking to his dad. He doesn't even call him his brother anymore. 
He's totally disowned his younger brother. And he's so angry and infuriated. He cannot believe his dad did this. And he goes on to say, There, I have served thee to his father. He says, Neither transgress I any time thy commandment. In verse number 30, he says, I've done all these things for you. And why are you treating my younger brother like you should be treating me? What are you doing, Father? Can't believe you're doing that. Both of these boys want wealth. They want prestige. They want comfort. They want independence. They want all these things from their father. One was the rule breaker. One was the rule follower. But they both wanted the same thing. So what, what is causing this to tear this family apart? And what is, has the ability to tear your family apart? Well, first of all, we see the assault on the home. But second of all, I want us to see because of selfishness. Because of selfishness. Kind of talked on this a little bit. But I want us to see that both of these boys show us the epitome of selfishness. And we want to see this through the younger brother's selfishness. He got what he wanted from his father and left. I want us to try to apply this to our life today. Perhaps you remember the day you gave your life to Christ. I mean, it was exciting to read your Bible and to pray and to ground yourself in the Word of God through discipleship. You wanted to be faithful to church. You wanted to give. You wanted to serve. You wanted to go soul winning. You wanted to obey God. But you missed somewhere along the line. You, you stopped having that relationship with Jesus Christ. You almost got in the mechanics of it all. Um, by the way, that's easy to do. If we're not careful, we can get in checkbox mode. Okay, I check off all my ten boxes. I'm, I'm a good Christian today. And, and we forget that what we do, we do because we love God. And we want a relationship with God. Well, this younger brother could care less about that relationship with the father. He started, he started out doing what his father said, obeying his father, doing all these things. But eventually it came a point where he says, I'm done with this. And maybe there's been a time in your life when you feel like God did not do exactly what you wanted him to do. Or maybe things were not coming out exactly like you wanted. And you said, you know what? I'm done with this. And we see the younger brother, selfishness, and he says, he says I'm done. I wanted your blessing. I wanted a home in heaven. I wanted my kids to be healthy. I wanted my kids to be successful. I want wealth. I want status. Give it to me all. That's all I want from you. Now, I don't think we start out that way. But if we're not careful, the flesh can get involved. Our selfishness can get involved. And we can start seeing what we can get out of God versus what we, can, what we have in Christ. Father, give me what I want, what I deserve. I don't want anything else. I don't care anymore. I want what I want. And then we see the older brother, his selfishness. In verse number 29, I talked about this already. Verse number 28. But it says there he was angry. This is probably the greatest day of his father's life when his younger brother comes home. Can you imagine that? Only pure hate and bitterness could keep you from being excited when someone you love dearly has the best day of their life. This older, this younger son finally comes home. The father gets the fatted calf, which back in those days, that was very lavish, very extravagant. You didn't just kill a, a calf for a meal. Probably the whole community came over. Could have been the biggest party ever thrown in that area. And they come home, and, and the, the, younger brother comes, uh, the younger brother comes home, and all this is thrown, and the older brother is, is infuriated. He's, he's ticked off. And even though this is the greatest day of his father's life, he's going to try to make it miserable. Why, why would he do that? Because his heart had been just as much on things than the brothers. You say, what do you mean? Well, the younger brother, who was a rule breaker, wanted everything from his dad. He left. The older brother, who was a rule follower, was doing it simply because of one day he would get two-thirds of the estate from his father. Now, oftentimes we look at the older brother and say, man, good job, older brother, you, you stayed around. But the older brother stayed around because he wanted what his father had to offer. Well, the good boy, bad boy selfishness, both are destroying this home. 
And so how does selfishness destroy your home? How does selfishness destroy my home? How does selfishness destroy your family and mine? Well, Genesis 3, 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it had, was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and dared eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and she, he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. And because of that, we know in Romans 5.12, the Bible says, Wherefore is by one man sin enter the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What happened was years ago, Adam and Eve was tricked and beguiled by the serpent, by Satan. And they said, if, he said, if you'll just take this fruit, you'll become his gods. So that they take the fruit and they realize right away they aren't becoming like gods. <laughs> They've just broken fellowship fellowship with the Father. And because of that, we are all sinners just like Adam and Eve were. We are born into sin. You see, selfishness can destroy our home because it is what we it's part of us. You know, our flesh is bent to do evil. Today I was turning on the road and someone floored around me and snuck, snuck in first. And I said, how dare you? I was first. Now, I'm sure in his mind he was first. I don't know. But it was amazing. And I, and I thought to myself, you're preaching on this tonight. And you just got upset because someone cut you off. Well, maybe they were in a hurry too. You know. My point is, our sin nature can destroy our home. Because our selfishness is always there. And that's what's destroying this home. Two brothers. One wanted everything quickly. The other one wanted everything later. But both of them were selfish. This extravagant, lavish, fatted calf was cutting into the brother's inheritance. And he was upset. He was infuriated. And so I wanted, that brings us to number three, the disordered love. So we see, first of all, uh, the assault on the home, second of all, because of selfishness. But third of all, I want us to see the disordered love. We are all driven by beauty, success, flashiness, prestige. If we're not careful, glimmering things can grab our attention. You know, we went fishing the other day, and one of the guys had this, this flashy silver thing, whatever. And my boy said, why would you put that in the water? Because it, 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 it distracts the fish, it attracts them. And we're the same way. We're attracted by things and, and flashy things. And if we are honest, we can go after things that only bring emptiness and unsatisfaction. Oftentimes, we go after things and we're constantly doing what we don't want to do and we can't stop doing. And then relationships break up. And why does this always happen? Well, Augustine said this. All of our problems come from disordered loves. What he was saying was, all our problems in our life come from loves that are, that are against what God has. If you, if you are selfish, you're going for something that probably isn't what, what God would have. And every sin we do can be traced to, back to selfishness because we have a greater love for something else than God. And therefore, all of the problems we have in our life and home come from disordered love. Disordered loves create three things in you. It can starve you, it can emotionally divide you, and it can enslave you. What are you saying, Pastor Justin? I'm simply saying this. When we put more desire in creation, something that's created, human beings or things, rather than our relationship with God, that's a disordered love. Think with me, if you will. What are something in your life that can cause you to get off focus of Jesus Christ or serving him? Well, that, that's a disordered love. And that's happening in these brothers' lives. That they're going after something that they think is going to fulfill them. They, they think if they can get it, they're truly going to be happy. When all along, the greatest love in their life was the father that was just sitting there waiting for them. He just wanted a relationship with them. I think we understand this. I mean, I, I'm rather young still, but some of you who are older probably have seen this over time and time again. 
But things and possessions and power and prestige and recognition only go so far. Eventually it becomes a little empty. But relationship and our home and our kids, that is what's so great. Our relationship with God is so amazing. And these two brothers are getting, are getting sidetracked here. And if we're not careful as Christians, we can get sidetracked too. What they failed to see was that loving relationships are the ultimate meaning of life. That was says in verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But he was yet a great way off. His father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That younger brother, for the first time, I think, truly understood the greatest feeling he had, hadn't felt in a long time. Someone actually cares for me. You know, when I come home from work, I, one of my, the best things in all the world is, is when you walk in the door and little Jackson comes running at me. Daddy! You know, when he gets to be about 200 pounds and he does that, he's going to knock me over. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that, okay. But it's interesting how here this boy comes home and sees his dad running to him. And, he, and I, I have to think he thought in his mind, I had it all wrong. I had it all wrong. And may I say today, may we, the heavenly, our Heavenly Father is that same Father for us. He's the creator of the universe. He knows everything. He's everywhere at once. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's sovereign ruler of all. And he wants a relationship with you and me. He, he craves it. He, he created us for that. And yeah, how oftentimes, if we're not careful, and I, I understand I'm talking to some of the core people in our church, so bear with me here, but if we're not careful, we can just get used to it. But may we never stop running into the Father's arms and spending time with him. We see the older brother became broken up, needy, and bitter because he was trying to fill that, that desire with things. The younger brother was addicted and he, he had to learn that, that that's not what was going to quench it. What was it? It was relationship with his father. You have disordered loves and salvation, selfishness and it must be healed. And it will only be healed when God becomes the center of your life. So that brings me to number four, and I want to kind of wrap things up tonight, but it's not going to be necessarily a quick wrap-up, okay? The unmatched grace, the unmatched grace. So I want to go back to the very beginning when the, the younger son um, wants, this, uh, 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 wants this inheritance from his father. And we see the younger son's share of the estate, as I mentioned, would have been one-third, and the older son would have been two-thirds, the father should have responded as a normal father would have responded, would have been upset, furious, beating him, driving him out of the house, but he did not do that. Had he done that, had he struck him on the face, had he verbally and physically gave blows to him, it would have turned into anger and bitterness for the son and anger and bitterness for the father. And oftentimes when someone hurts us, we want to respond the same way because we think it's going to heal the hurt. But it will not. The father, if he would have done that, he would have never seen reconciliation. But I want us to see something in verse 12. The Bible says there in verse number 15, And the younger of them said unto his father, Give me the portion of goods that follows to me. And he divided unto them his living. If you look at the word living, the Greek and Hebrew word for it is bios, and it means, it means life. So keep in mind back then they did not have ATM machines that you could go up to and your son says, hey, I want a third of my inheritance. Give it to me. Okay, let me punch in the figures and here you go. Couldn't do that. Didn't have that much wealth. The land was with them for generation and generation. It was part of them. It was part of their name, part of their heritage. So the only way the father could have kept the chance for the future reconciliation was to divide or literally tear his life apart, if you, know, if you understand what I'm getting at. He didn't have the money. He would have had to kill himself or he would have had to sell part of the land. He would have had to give part of it away for the younger man, to, the younger son to get his inheritance. But I want to encourage you this morning 
this evening that in ancient times a family land, of course, was their identity. But in our flesh, we would have responded in anger, but not this father. This father was willing to suffer for his son's sin. He was able, he did it for the possibility of redemption. And he bore the agony of his son's sin for the possibility of future reconciliation. He was, able to, he was willing to do the most painful thing he had to do at that time. And he was literally willing to sell part of his heritage, part of his land, part of his, his, his name. He, he, he was willing to sell part of it for his son. I want to encourage you this, morning, this evening that there was another father who was willing to tear himself apart for you and me. For reconciliation. There's another father who is willing to give of himself on a cross to pay for your sins and mine. There's another father who was willing to be the victim so that one day you could experience the victory. There is another father who is willing to be both the priest and the sacrifice. He was willing, out of slaves, he became a slave for us. He was willing to serve you and I instead of himself. And here's where I'm trying to get to tonight. We see selfishness from these two boys, and that really represents you and me. The Father represents God. And Jesus Christ was willing to give of himself on the cross for you and me. What would cause someone to do that? Love. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our sin is keeping us from God. And Jesus Christ was willing to die on a cross to pay for your sin and mine. You understand tonight that sin is missing the mark. You can never be good enough to pay for your sin. Jesus Christ was the only one who could do it because he was God. He was perfect. He was willing to be torn apart, to be crucified for you and for me. He was willing to take your punishment on himself. Why? Because he, he wanted reconciliation. He wanted you to be reconciled with the Father. He wanted you to be able to one day come back to him. And he was willing to give it all on the cross for you and me. All you must do, though, is invite him into your life. You say, ah, oh, that's too easy. <laughs> I mean, I surely got to be good. I got to go to church. I got to do, do good things. I can do A, B, C, D. No, no, no. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Do you realize tonight that what Jesus did for you is what this father did for his sons? He was willing to tear himself apart for you and for me and our selfishness, our sin, what we wanted. I want my way. I want it my way, and I want to do it the way I want it to. And God says, okay. I mean, I sure do want to be king of your life. I sure do want to be the, your heavenly father. I, I really want to help you. But go ahead, do your thing. I didn't create you to be a robot. But may I encourage us to realize the father never leaves or forsakes us. He wants nothing more than to see you run back to him. First of all, for salvation. You only have to do that once. But second of all, he is there. He's there for you all the time. Whether you want him to or not, he's there. Will you come to Jesus tonight? But second of all, will you allow Jesus Christ to heal your hurts? Augustine also said this, Rightly will my soul be fixed on him, and this will heal all the diseases of my soul. You know the only way to heal the selfishness in your home is Jesus Christ. When you realize what he did for you and you run to him. That's why it's so important to lead, nurture, teach and train your children to come to Jesus Christ. Why? Because they need him in their life. They need him to change their heart. They need him to heal their diseases. They need Jesus Christ to heal them. Jesus Christ needs to heal your disease. You say, well, you don't understand what I've been through. I, I may not, but I know Jesus Christ wants to heal that for only he can heal our soul's diseases. So tonight we see two brothers. One was a rule breaker, one was a rule follower. But both of them were focused on what they could get from their daddy. 
neither of them wanted the relationship with him. If we're not careful, we see both of these boys end up in misery. Now, thankfully, the one came around. Selfishness will always destroy your life. Things, possessions, drive for, 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 for uh, 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 significance, for power. I just want to be somebody. I want people just to notice me. No, no, no. May we, never, may we never forget that the biggest thing in life is your relationship with God. Putting him first. Listening to him. Following him. Following in love with him. I talked to the, teen, the children and teens this morning how, how Jesus wants just once, one of the three things he requires from us in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, is, is, is a relationship with him, a fellowship with him, to righteous and to do uh, uh, justly and, and, and to emulate mercy, but also a relationship with him. These boys realized the, most, the younger brother finally fulfilled, or felt the most fulfilling when he ran back to his father. He realized he missed it all along. The older brother, I don't know if he ever came to that. But what drove this family apart? Selfishness. So what can drive us and our spouse apart? Selfishness. What can drive our kids apart from a selfishness? But Jesus Christ is the only one who can heal that. And when we rest in what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary, we can say, hey, if Jesus was willing to do that for me, maybe I can get away from my selfishness and I can serve him. I, I've had the opportunity of pastoring in Turlock, and of course now here for a little bit, and the Lord allowed me to work with, with quite a few people. And I don't say that, say, look at me. I'm just simply saying I've, I've, I've worked with enough people that you can see families who, who try to put God as the center of life. It, it, just, it just works out. I'll never forget a couple um, that I was working with, and they were doing very well. And one day they came to me and, and uh, he says, I'm, I'm just done. I'm just done. I'm, I'm just leaving the church. I'm, I'm just done. I said, why? He says, because there's just, there's got to be more. I, 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 want, I, want my, I want all these things. I'm going to leave my wife and get, I'm just going to do it all. I, I saw him a few months later, maybe a year or two later, and you could just see the misery on his face. I'm just simply saying tonight, that God is the only one who can really fill that gaping hole in your heart. And when you allow God to do that, all your other relationships seem to start working out. And by the way, if the husband and wife are both doing that, woo that's really great. If the kids are doing that, man, it's a really happy home. And we're, we're learning that as we grow and our kids grow. And we, if one's selfish, you can make it miserable for everyone else. We all must decide put God first in our life. Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight. Let me encourage you tonight to, to see a picture of these two sons. Where are you at tonight? Do you feel like selfishness is, you, you're, you're, you maybe don't even realize it, but you're chasing after the wrong things, and because of it, it's affecting your home, maybe, maybe it's affecting your life. May I encourage you to realize what's most important, relationship and love, versus things, power, prestige, uh, uh, being recognized, that next award. And then second tonight, I, I wonder if maybe there's someone who, who didn't quite understand what Jesus Christ has done for them. I mean, God, the God of the universe was willing to come to earth to be born in the manger and then to die on a cross to pay for the sins of selfish people, sinners. That's really you and me. That, that's me, that's you. And do you realize tonight that Jesus Christ came for you? He, he died for you. He was beaten for you. He, he bore all your sins on the cross, all my sins on the cross, to pay for your sins. Maybe there's someone tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, you know what, Pastor Justin, I, I'll be honest, I, I never realized what Jesus Christ did for me. And Man, if he'd let me, I, I'd love to let him take care of my sin for me. And I, I would love to begin a relationship with him. I'd love to go to heaven when I die. Pastor Justin, would you pray for me? No one's looking around. Eyes are, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe there's someone tonight that would say, that's me, Pastor Justin. I, I would like to invite Jesus Christ in my life. If that's you, would you slip up your hand real quickly? I want to pray for you. Maybe there's someone that knows for sure they're going to heaven. But maybe you'd say, you know what? 
I, I have some hurts, I have some bitterness, and I realize tonight that only Jesus Christ can heal that. Uh, my spouse can't do that. 